My pleasure now to welcome our third speaker of the night, uh, Ms. Kina Trowell. Uh, and uh, Kina is a PhD student in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, working with myself and Professor David Frost. And Kina is going to talk to us tonight about a new type of energy material or a new type of fuel uh, that's based on metals um, that can be produced and consumed and recycled without any intrinsic carbon dioxide emissions. Kina. Every year, humanity uses 500 exajoules of energy. That's a 500 followed by 18 zeros. And that number is only going to go up. And that's a good thing, because it means that life is getting better for people. It's this reliable access to cheap energy that's allowed us in the West to improve our standards of living. In 19th century Europe, when this wasn't the case, life expectancy was about 45 years. Now it's 80. Infant mortality has dropped from 15% to less than 2%. And this map gives us a pretty good idea of where standards of living are pretty good. If they're lit up at night, it means there's reliable access to energy. It also tells us where we need to get more energy. Places like Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of South Africa. These are places where sanitation, access to clean drinking water, the necessities of life still lag behind. And so it's clear we need to produce more energy. But the way that we make energy now is through the combustion of fossil fuels, and climate change is real, it's happening, and it's because of the combustion of fossil fuels. So what do we do? On Earth, we have available to us two primary sources of energy, solar and nuclear. Nuclear reactors, of course, but it's also nuclear um, energy that runs on any geothermal system. And it's also nuclear fusion that runs the sun. But for today, we'll call it another primary energy source. And when I say solar energy, you probably think about solar panels, solar concentrators, of course. But it's also the sun that drives the wind. And it's also the sun that drives our water cycle. So all of our wind and hydro-based energy is really just converted solar energy. We also use solar energy through photosynthesis. So all of the energy we get from biomass, and this includes the food that we eat, as well as fossil fuels, is also just converted solar energy. And so this is what's gotten us into trouble, is that we've literally burned through millions of years of solar energy in just a few decades. And we need to switch to using the solar energy that's available to us in a much smarter way. The good news is that enough solar energy hits the Earth's surface every hour to meet our energy needs for an entire year. And we also have very good technologies for converting that solar energy into electricity. But where there's still a big challenge is in how do we capture that energy so that we can store it for long periods of time and move it over long distances. And so that's the key question. How do we move and store this clean energy in a clean way? Well, we need some sort of new solar fuel because we can't keep using these fossil fuels. So this is the periodic table of elements. And this is everything that we have available to us in the entire universe. So we need to pick from this. Now, of course, some elements are gonna work better than others as a solar fuel. The first criteria is reactivity. The way we get energy out of anything is through a reaction, and this can be a chemical reaction or a combustion reaction. And so we want something that reacts with air or with water and does so at a reasonable rate. So we can't use any of these elements. Because we want to be able to move this energy around pretty conveniently, we don't want anything that's too heavy. So we can't use any of these elements. We don't want anything that's rare, because that's going to get expensive, so we can't use any of these elements. Um, we don't want anything that's toxic or that becomes toxic once it reacts with air or water, so we can't use any of these elements. And then finally, um, because we don't want our energy system competing with our food system and we need potassium for fertilizer, I'm just going to take that off the list now. So this is what we're left with. And I don't think it's surprising that we see carbon up there because that's what forms the basis of our fuel system now. And one of the big advantages that these carbon-based fuels offer us is energy density. We can get a lot of energy into a relatively small, light package. 
So a liter of gasoline has about 45 megajoules of energy. So when you fill your gas tank, you've got about 2,000 megajoules of energy. That's enough energy to run the typical Canadian household for about two weeks. So it's quite a bit of energy. But uh, it's the combustion of fossil fuels that's causing climate change, and so we can't really use that. So we'll take that off the list. Um, another thing you see up here is hydrogen, and you've probably heard about the hydrogen economy, and hydrogen is a clean burning fuel, and that's true. Hydrogen can be burned in air without releasing any greenhouse gases. The challenge with hydrogen is that it's not very energy dense. So to carry around that same amount of energy, even if you compress that hydrogen into its liquid state, you would still need five tanks. So it's not a very convenient way to move energy around. So once we remove carbon and hydrogen, this is it. This is what we're really left with. And you'll see that these things all have something in common, and that is that they're all metals. And in our group, we're looking at all of these. And it's important to think about that we are already using metals as a fuel. So this isn't a new idea, necessarily. So for example, lithium, um, lithium, the lightest uh, metal, is the fuel in a lithium ion battery, right? So although the lithium itself is very energy dense, you'd only need about one and a half tanks, once you use that lithium to make a lithium ion battery, well, batteries have to carry around all of their reactants and a bunch of infrastructure in order to make them safe and reliable. And so to carry that same amount of energy, you would actually need about 45 tanks worth of lithium ion battery. Lithium air batteries are much better in terms of energy density and specific energy that we heard about earlier, but you'd still need about nine tanks worth of it. So while batteries are very good in some applications, they're great for your phone, for your computer, all the way up to passenger vehicles, these lithium ion and lithium air batteries do a really good job, but they're not well suited as a solar fuel. So, like I said, our group is looking at all of these metals, and aluminum here has really come out as the front runner in my research. First of all, it's very energy dense. You'd only need about half a tank to carry around that same amount of energy. So I think it's clear what I'm getting at here, right? That I want to use this as the fuel of the future. Now, aluminum is very energy dense, we just saw that, but it's also very common. It's the third most common element in the Earth's crust, so that's, that's, got, uh, that's good for us. Um, it's also relatively light and inexpensive, and we have really good technologies for processing it and for recycling it. And these processes are just getting cleaner and cleaner, and there's even some promising technology on the horizon that's gonna allow us to recycle aluminum without, re without producing any carbon emissions. So there's two ways that you can use aluminum as a fuel. The first way is to burn it in air. And when you burn aluminum in air, this can be done without releasing any greenhouse gases. And all of that stored energy is released as heat, the same way that uh, when you burn coal, all of the stored energy is released as heat, and then that heat can be used for something useful like running your power plant. And the other way to use aluminum as a fuel is to react it with water. When you react it with water, about half of the energy is released in the form of heat, and the other half in the form of hydrogen. So you can use that heat directly, and then you can also use that hydrogen directly to feed it into a fuel cell to produce electricity, or you can burn it in air, and again, this can be done without releasing greenhouse gases, and you can use all of that heat for something useful. Now this aluminum water reaction is very powerful. That means a lot of energy is released in a very small amount of time because that oxygen molecule is just ripped right off the hydrogen or the hydrogen in the water molecule. And a lot of energy is released in a small amount of time. How much energy? It's enough to launch a rocket. So what would an aluminum fuel cycle look like? Well, I like to think about it as the aluminum fuel recycle because aluminum is so recyclable. So this is how it would work. Wherever it is that you have clean energy, whether that is uh, solar, wind, hydro, what have you, you would use that to process the aluminum. When aluminum is processed, its energy state is increased, so it's effectively storing all of that clean energy. And because of its high energy density, it's a very convenient way to move that energy around. So you can store it for long periods of time and ship it to wherever it is that you need it. When you need that energy, you would react the aluminum with water to release the energy, and then you can use it for whatever you want. And then there's this last step. 
is there's a third reactant in the aluminum water reaction, which is aluminum oxide. And Sarah mentioned this a little bit earlier. This is, a, this is an inert ceramic solid product. And because it's inert and solid, it's easy to capture and store, and then it can be transported back to wherever it is that you have that clean energy available for recycling. And this is how that loop gets closed. So that's the big picture. Zooming in a little bit, this is what the reaction actually looks like. And in my research, I'm doing these, temp these reactions at increased temperatures. Increasing the reaction temperature gives us two benefits. The first one is faster reaction rates. Faster reaction rates just means that the heat in that hydrogen is released quickly, and that's what we need for high power. The second advantage it gives us is that we get increased yields. And what we want is full yield or 100% yield. These are all just different ways of saying more efficient use of the fuel in the system. We want to release all of the hydrogen as possible and leave behind no unoxidized aluminum in the system. And we can achieve full yield. So for example, here around 100 degrees Celsius, we get full yield of this 120 nanometer particle powder. The problem is that Nano powders are very fine. So this one, for example, is about 1 50th the size of a human blood cell. It's, it's tiny. And because it's so small, it's also very expensive to produce. And so what we want to do is to be able to go up to larger, coarser particles. But when we do that at these low temperatures, we, don't, we get very low yields. And this is like having, let's say, filling your gas tank and then um, 60 to 80% of everything that you put in your gas tank just washes out the other side before you even turn on your car. So in my experiments, or sorry, to understand this, we need to look at the aluminum at the level of the particle. On the surface of the particle is this aluminum oxide layer. And because aluminum is so reactive in air, this layer forms as soon as aluminum is exposed to air at all. It's a very, very thin layer, and it's a very, very dense layer, and it protects the bulk aluminum underneath. And so this is a really good thing, because what it means is that it's protecting the aluminum beneath from premature oxidation, and this is what's gonna allow us to move that aluminum around and store it for long periods of time and not have to worry about, oh, it gets a little wet and then there's a bunch of hydrogen. But it also means that we need to <clears throat> create the right conditions for the reaction to happen. And so the reaction interface isn't at the surface of the particle, but rather it's here, where the bulk aluminum meets the aluminum oxide. So you can think of this aluminum oxide like a fence protecting the aluminum inside it. And so for the reaction to proceed, water needs to get to the other side of the fence. So that's the first step in the reaction, is that the water compromises this surface layer. And this has to be done under the right conditions. It won't happen accidentally, necessarily. Um, so this is as if that fence has, uh, there's a bunch of holes in it. And once there's enough holes that are big enough, then the reaction can really proceed. And then this is when you get that fast release of heat and hydrogen. But as that heat and hydrogen is, is being released, which is what we want, there's also simultaneously a formation of new oxides. So now it's as if that fence has begun repairing itself and then it's also started to grow taller and taller. Eventually it gets to a point where water can't get to the other side anymore and the reaction quenches completely. And if this happens before all of the aluminum has been consumed, this is when we get less than 100% yield and you're left with this aluminum core, which is really just wasted fuel. So in my research, what I'm trying to do is just make sure that water can always get to the other side of that fence. And I'm doing this by increasing the reaction temperature to have the reaction happen in liquid water between 200 and 400 degrees Celsius. And when I say liquid water, this just means that I want the water to not go through a phase change. I don't want it to boil. But you might be thinking, well, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. And that's true. But it's only true at one atmosphere of pressure, which is about the amount of pressure in this room right now. And so, if you want to increase the temperature of liquid water, you also need to increase the pressure in the vessel holding that water. 
So for example, if you wanted 350 degree water, you'd need to go to about 155 atmosphere of pressure, which is about the same amount of pressure you need to crush a car. And the easiest way to do this, uh, to increase the pressure in a vessel, is to put a lid on it. So this is my reactor in my lab with its lid, and it's very well secured to keep that pressure in. And then there's some insulation to direct the heat into the reactor where I want it. And then some instruments to measure temperature and pressure as the experiment proceeds. The other thing about this line is that it ends. And it ends at this point called the critical point. At temperatures and pressures above the critical point of water, water starts behaving very differently. The most interesting thing for me in this case is that things that don't dissolve in regular water can dissolve in supercritical water. Things like metal oxides. And if you remember, it's the formation of these oxides on the surface of the particle that prevent us from always getting full yield. And so the thinking is that in the supercritical water, yes, the oxides will still form, but they won't be very coherent and they won't adhere to the surface of the particle. And so it's as if, yes, that fence is there, but it's, it's, there's so many holes in it and it's been so poorly built that it doesn't matter. Water can still get to the other side. So I'll quickly show you some of my data. When I started these experiments, I started with the same 12 micron powder and saw that if I went to a high enough temperature, I got full yield. So naturally, I wanted to go to a larger particle. So this is a 55 micron particle. And we also got full yield once we went to high enough temperatures. So then I wanted to test the largest available metal powder that we have, which is this 108 micron powder. So now we're at about the width of a human hair. And um, we saw that at two, 250 degrees, no yield. It, it was, nothing happened. It was only once we got to really high temperatures that we got this full yield, and this is in the supercritical regime. So what this early data is telling us is that it is possible to get full yield and high reaction rates in very coarse particles in supercritical water. And so this, the data that I'm gathering in this work is laying the groundwork for the design of metal water reactors that we can use and actually hook up to a piece of equipment. The, one of the big advantages of metal water reactions is that they're scalable. And so what we can do is we can design reactors so that they can work for different power applications. So smaller reactors can run maybe a steam, tur steam turbine and a fuel cell, modified diesel engine, gas turbine engine, all the way up to grid power production. So here, instead of burning coal to run your turbines, what you're doing is that you're taking out the coal combustor and you're replacing that with a metal water reactor and having your power system run off of the products of the metal water reaction instead of coal. Then there's two other things I want to point out here. One is that <clears throat> a lot of engines already exist, right? And so going, switching to a new fueling system can be an expensive proposition. But metal water reactions, because of the products that they produce, that heat and that hydrogen, a lot of engines can actually be retrofit so that instead of burning fossil fuels, they can be powered off of the products of the metal water reaction. And the second thing is that these applications, these are what we call high power applications. And these are the kind of applications that right now are still heavily reliant on fossil fuels. And these high temperature metal water reactions are one way that we can actually end our relationship with fossil fuels because this is what's keeping us hanging on because this is what runs our critical infrastructure. Now I started out by saying that energy demand is only going to increase and that that's a good thing because it means life is getting better for people. For communities to be able to raise a standard of living, they need access to reliable energy so that they can do things like run a sanitation system, clean water system, hospitals, all of the things that make life good and comfortable and convenient. And the good news is that we've got lots of solar energy hitting our planet every hour. The challenge lies in how do we capture this energy, store it, and move it around. And with these high temperature metal water reactions, it's one way that we're gonna be able to transition from this world to this world. And this is a world where everybody who wants energy has access to energy, 
wherever they want it, whenever they want it. Thank you very much, Kina. Thank you, Kina. So at this time, we can take uh, one or two questions for Kina, and then we'll open it up for questions um, to the general group. Yes. Yes. We all take oh, you've got it. Good. Let's go. Hamid Reza, a different bombardier. I have a question for you, actually. Um, more than 96% of Earth's uh, water is contained in the oceans as uh, sand water. Uh, I wanted to specifically address this question. How do you... How do you consider this in your study? Does this, because we're not in the sustainability context, we're not gonna, um, you know, uh, put into danger actually those 3.6, let's say, or 4% roughly speaking, um, in danger. How do you address this? Does yep. this affect the, um, the efficiency of the process going on? Okay. Thanks. Um, so that's a really great question. So it really comes down to, here I am talking about sustainability, proposing that we use a bunch of water to make energy. Well, um, this metal water reaction actually works better with salt water. That's the short answer. And I mean, of course, in the, in the research at the lab scale, we're using deionized, very, very pure water. But when it comes to deployment, um, there's already been research done in this area that shows that the, uh, the salt water actually works better. Well, once we get into supercritical, I mean, this is a little inside baseball, but um, once we get into supercritical water, um, <laughs> it really does a good job of like, managing anything that's fed into it. So you might, want, you might need to filter out particulates and things like that, but when it comes to an actual sort of like chemical removal of salt or anything like that, there's no need. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you for that. That's a very compelling story, and, and I get everything in the front end where uh, you're, you're taking clean energy and um, shipping the source of the energy somewhere. Um, in terms of the recycle, uh, do you think there is a like, feasible distance where you want to send it out so that you don't have to invest too much energy then bringing the aluminum oxide back to recycle? Is there a feasibility point for the distribution? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I'm, sure, I'm sure there would be, and I think that that's more of an economic question to me than a, than a science question. But so I look at our energy system now, right? And so, okay, like, where does the natural gas we burn come from? Where does the, where do the gasoline that we're burning, where is that coming from? And so, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I think would sort itself out on, a, on an economic scale, because we're already doing this with fossil fuels, is that a ship storing them and then shipping them over great distances. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of figuring out the infrastructure and those tipping points that would make um, aluminum as a fuel viable or, or iron as a fuel viable. Any other questions? For Kino or for any of our other speakers, we could invite you up if there's any other questions. Any last questions, last chance? No? Okay, with that, then uh, we'll thank Kina again for her presentation. Thank you. We'll take the, the clicker. So without further ado, um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our first speaker, who is Sarah Imbrilio from the Department of Mining and Materials Engineering. And Sarah's working with Professor Richard Cromick and Professor Reno Gauvin in, uh, in, uh, on her PhD research. And Sarah's gonna talk to us tonight about how we can reduce the energy and reduce the waste during the manufacturing of advanced materials through the cold spray process. Sarah. Industrial development has allowed us to significantly improve our quality of life. 
And that's ultimately because the products output from these industries are what allow us to have the things we have and do the things we do. But if we are to keep moving forward in a sustainable way, we need to make sure that we answer one key question. And that question is, how do we achieve harmony between the industry and the environment? And to do this, we need to consider every step of the life cycle of a product we're designing. And that's from where are we getting the materials to how are we making it, how are we producing it, and then eventually how will we dispose of it. And in every single one of these steps, you need to think, how am I affecting the environment? And how, will I, how can I ultimately reduce that environmental impact? But I want to focus here today on one example that pertains mainly to manufacturing and the products that we're making. And you'll notice here that the two examples I've used to represent the product come from the transportation industry. And that's because the transportation industry and the manufacturing industry have one key thing in common. They're wasting 20% of the world's energy. Can you guess how? To overcoming friction. That's right, we are losing 20% of the world's energy to friction. This has huge environmental and economic consequences. Think about the cost of the energy. Think about the energy we're producing is coming mainly from fossil fuels, and therefore how much toxic gases we're emitting without even using that energy properly. And finally, with more friction typically comes more wear, and more wear means more waste. So how do we overcome these issues? Well, it turns out there's an entire field of study focused on some issues that revolve around friction and other type of issues similar to this. And those are, and this, this field of study is surface engineering. And surface engineering focuses mainly on the development of high-performance surfaces. And this can be to overcome any type of environment. But the type of things that we tend to look at are how do we increase wear, uh, increase wear resistance, increase corrosion resistance, and also reduce friction. But to do this, we need to look at both what materials we'll be using and what processes will, will, will we make these new coatings with? So when we choose the materials, the first thing we need to think is what materials do I have available to me? And the three major classes that tend to come up are metals, ceramics, and polymers. Now, these materials, unfortunately, on their own, don't necessarily offer the, men, the type of properties that, we're, that we need. And that's because, for example, each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. For example, a metal might be very ductile, but in consequence is not very hard. Or a ceramic is very hard, but then is not very ducto, ductile, and that's why it results in fracture, typically. So, it turns out that if you combine these materials in order to form a composite, you can actually take advantages of each of the material and tailor a new material that will give you the properties you need. In my work, I focus on metal ceramic composites. And we often re refer to these as metal matrix composites. And these do offer us increased hardness, increased wear resistance, increased corrosion resistance, and even self-lubricating properties. And that goes back to that friction issue. If we could make self-lubricating properties, we can reduce friction and even try and reduce the need for toxic lubricants in various industries. So how do we make these metal matrix composites? The, the technique I'm proposing here today is the cold spray process. The cold spray process is actually quite an, a simple technique and has only three major components. The first one is the high pressure gas. The second, the powder feeder. And the third is the cold spray gun, or we also refer to this as the cold spray nozzle. 
The gas coming from the high pressure tank will travel both towards the gun and towards the powder feeder. And the portion going towards the gun directly will be heated. And you'll see in this short video how all of these components work together to ultimately deposit a coating. The gas that's going directly to the powder feeder will allow the powder to be injected into that gas stream. Once it reaches the nozzle, it recombines with the heated gas and can then go through the nozzle and achieve uh, supersonic velocities. The particles coming out of this nozzle then impact the part and can create a coating. But why cold spray? Why not any other technique? Well, it turns out the cold spray process is quite environmentally friendly. The gas we're using is nitrogen. Nitrogen is found in the air that surrounds us and is therefore non-toxic to us. The powder that we're using is not melted. These are deposited in their solid state. And by not melting these metals, we are not getting any byproducts. But another interesting thing is that the, t the heat input that we're putting in, so the energy that we're putting into the process, is actually not significant since we're not melting that powder. And also, there's various research being done to optimize the nozzles to try and increase velocity simply through the nozzle characteristics rather than increasing velocity through uh, an increase in temperature. So if we do this, we might eventually even remove the need for that heat input. And another thing is that this is an additive process. So we are getting nearly 100% of the powder we're trying to deposit, deposit it in the, in the coating. But in order to do that, you need to understand how these coatings are being formed. And you need to understand the deposition mechanism, how they're bonding, and all kinds of characteristics like this. And that's where work like mine comes in. But just a little side note, this, co this coating technology is not limited to thin coatings. We can actually grow features onto a part because we can make thick coatings. And we can use this even for repairs. But how do these particles get deposited? I mentioned in order to get that 100% deposition, you need to understand the bonding mechanism. In metal-metal interfaces, the bonding mechanism is mainly through what we call plastic deformation. This plastic deformation is basically a term that we refer to as a permanent deformation of a material. And it's really that impact that induces the plastic deformation and results in bonding. And in metals, plasticity is really well understood. Take, for example, a fork. If you try and bend the fork, it'll maintain its shape. And it's the fact that it maintains that shape that is called plastic deformation. But if you think of a cup, can you do that? Especially in an impact scenario, what you would mainly expect to happen is this. But luckily, we can create metal matrix composites by cold spray. So let's see what's happening there. When we spray these coatings, we have both metal and ceramic powder being sprayed simultaneously. And when we spray these, we have four different types of interfaces. A metal impacting a metal, which bonds, as we explained, through that plastic deformation. A ceramic impacting a ceramic, which unfortunately does lead to fracture. And finally, we have the metal ceramic interfaces. And these metal ceramic interfaces are unfortunately not well understood. And that's what my research focuses on. When I'm trying to look at these metal ceramic interfaces, there are two things that, I'd that I'm focusing on at the moment. The first one being, is what velocity do I need in order to achieve deposition? Just to give you an analogy here, these particles technically need to bond through plastic deformation. And as I mentioned, the ceramic won't plastically deform. So in that metal ceramic interface, what do I need to get a bond and why is it bonding? You could think back to when you were a kid playing with Play-Doh and you threw it at a wall 
In some cases, it bounced back at you. But if you threw it hard enough, it could actually stick there. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to see here. What is hard enough to get bonding? And we study this by changing the ceramic and seeing how the type of ceramic that we're using will influence the critical velocity for deposition. But once these particles have been deposited, we need to know how well are they bonding? How good is that adhesion strength? And once again, we study this by looking at how the type of ceramic will affect it and also how surface roughness could affect it. So let's start with the deposition velocity and looking at how the deposition velocity is affected by the type of ceramics. To do this, I did experiments at MIT. These experiments were basically to spray those particles towards the two ceramics and capture the impact with a high-speed camera. The ceramics that we used for this were aluminum oxide and silicon carbide. And once this metallic particle passed in front of the high-speed camera, you could see when it will bond and when it won't. So in a case that it didn't bond, this is what the images would look like. Effectively, you can see that the particle is impacting at a relatively high velocity and then rebounds. And the rebound velocity is actually lower than the impact velocity. And in fact, if you take a ratio between the rebound velocity and the impact velocity, you get what we call a coefficient of restitution. And this is basically a measure of how much energy is lost during that impact. So it's a quantification of, of the amount of energy you're losing due to plastic deformation. And if you were to take this particular um, experiment and plot it on a graph with respect to the impact velocity, you would get this. And if you repeat this multiple times, you would get a series of points that show you how that coefficient of restitution varies with impact velocity. And eventually, you'll get adhesion. And this is an image that we observe when the particle does not rebound. And what you'll see is that on this coefficient of restitution graph, these will appear as points on the x-axis. And you could see that at, a, at around 600 meters per second, you'll get adhesion. But these are the results for titanium deposited on aluminum oxide. What happens when we deposit on silicon carbide? In fact, what we observed was that the critical velocity is closer to 800 meters per second. So changing the ceramic has a significant influence on the velocity you need to be spraying these at. So now let's look closer at the particles that bonded and how strong is the adhesion strength and how the type of ceramic will influence it and how surface roughness will influence it. To do this, we sprayed the single particles towards aluminum oxide with different surface roughnesses and then repeated the experiment with titanium deposited on silicon carbide. And at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, if you're depositing these single particles, how can you test their adhesion strength? We have a specialized equipment to do this. And this equipment effectively comes and removes the splat, or the splat is what we refer to as the particle bonded to that part. Um, it comes and removes it and can measure that adhesion strength. And the results we've seen were actually quite interesting. The adhesion was higher to the low surface roughness aluminum oxide than to the high surface roughness aluminum oxide. And this is kind of counterintuitive because if the bond was only mechanical, you would expect that with more surface roughness, it would kind of be clamped in there. But that's not what we're seeing. It's not giving a higher bond strength. Another analogy would be if you're trying to remove gum off a glass or off of a carpet, usually the higher surface roughness gives the higher bond strength. We're not seeing that. Also, changing the substrate to silicon carbide allowed us to compare how aluminum oxide behaves and how silicon carbide behaves. And what we saw was that the silicon carbide bonds with a much lower bond strength 
than the aluminum oxide in any of its surface roughnesses. And why do we get this low surface rough, uh, why do we get this low bond strength? To understand this, we need to go to the scanning electron microscope and analyze the cross sections of these in, uh, interfaces. And what we can see is the morphology at the interface and we can understand if there's any ke chemical changes or chemical, um, if the composition changes at that interface, but we're actually gonna need to go even further than that and see at the atomic scale if there's any chemical interaction to explain why surface roughness has a counterintuitive effect and how the different ceramics play a role in here. We saw that, the, that the changing the ceramic had an effect on both adhesion strength and on the velocity you need to de deposit these. But once we've completed all of this work, we're gonna need to think back and see how these single particles reflect in a full metal matrix composite coating. But this work will help us improve those metal matrix composites. And by improving these metal matrix composites, we can go back to that manufacturing and transportation industry and see advantages in reducing friction. We're gonna reduce our energy consumption reduce the amounts of toxic emissions, and also reduce waste. But just before ending, I'd like to say one more note about the manufacturing industry. Today I presented a technique that is not only created for these metal matrix composites. It's actually an environmentally friendly technique with other applications. And the study of these metal ceramic interfaces can allow us to use this environmentally friendly technology to even potentially deposit metal coatings on ceramics. And this could have huge implications in biomedical industries because, for instance, titanium and aluminum oxide, which are showing the higher bond strengths, are both biocompatible materials. This can help us in improving artificial joints. We can even think of electronics industry. We can generate customizable circuitry or metal ceramic seals. And I'm sure there's millions of other applications I haven't even thought of. And it is the development of these environmentally friendly manufacturing techniques, thinking about the materials we're trying to produce with them that are bringing us one step closer to achieving harmony between the environment and industry. Thank you very much, Sarah. So we have time now for one or two questions. Do we have a microphone? Yeah, perfect. Any questions at the back here? Which one of the two ceramics has a higher porosity? Um, they're actually quite comparable. Um, I've cross-sectioned them and they're sintered ceramics, so we're not seeing a significant amount of porosity in there. One thing that we did see, though, was that when we impact the silicon carbide, um, the interface tends to show more porosity, and that's probably because there's fracture occurring. So um, I don't think it's related to porosity necessarily, but I do think that um, the mechanical properties of the ceramic itself has more of an impact. Any other questions? So the, the powder that we <laughs> the, the powder that we are using was plasma atomized, which is actually a Montreal um, invented technology. Um, but I don't know exactly what you would like to. <laughs> well, in terms of the, the, the larger impact, if you look at the whole life cycle process, mm -hmm. you try to raise well the process. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a difficult issue for um, I haven't considered it, to be completely honest, um, but I do think that the technology is advancing significantly, especially with um, 
uh, advances in additive manufacturing. So the powder we are using is the same powder you would use in additive manufacturing. So um, I do think that maybe at this point in time, we are not at a very uh, environmentally friendly level at the production of powder, but we will eventually get there. Maybe more to come on that later. So with that, I'd like to thank Sarah again. Thank you. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, the second uh, change maker to the stage tonight, Shrai Shrai Yuan. Shrai Shrai is a PhD student in the Department of Mining and Materials Engineering working with Professor Kirk Bevan. And Shrai Shrai is gonna talk to us tonight about how we can design better batteries from the atomic scale up. Uh, and she's gonna tell us about polarons, which is a new concept for me and I'm sure also for many of you. Um, and that are, these polarons are very important in determining the electrical properties of advanced materials that you'd use both in batteries but also in a variety of other renewable energy technologies. Ready? Okay. So with that, Treasurer. Thank you. Every day we use different kinds of electronic devices. A laptop, a mobile phone, a tablet, but we are never satisfied. We always want the devices to somehow run faster, but at the same time, smaller and lighter. One of the things particularly we are not satisfied about is rechargeable batteries. We want to have better rechargeable batteries inside the devices that is longer lasting, but at the same time, smaller and lighter. The batteries inside these devices are called lithium-ion batteries. Lithium-ion batteries power everything from the electronic devices we use every day to the electric cars. In the electric cars, the weight of the battery, the capacity of the battery, is especially more important because they determine the speed and the driving distance that we could achieve. Imagine if we can improve these batteries, our life will be much easier. We don't have to charge our phone every day, and we can drive our electric cars without range anxiety. How satisfied is that? Scientists and engineers have tried many alternative approaches to battery chemistry and design in order to get smaller, longer lasting, and more powerful batteries. One of their trials is on lithium air battery because this lithium air battery has far higher energy per mass than the conventional lithium ion battery I have just mentioned. The reason for that is, at negative electrode, there is only lithium, the lightest metal in the world. And at positive electrode, the reaction is reduction of oxygen supply from air, which means there is almost no weight at all, because oxygen is not stored in this battery, it is just from air. Practically speaking, this saves a lot of weight, but it also brings us its own difficulties. For example, when the car is running, the battery is in the discharge process. During the discharge, oxygen reacts with lithium plus ions to form lithium peroxide. And as the battery is discharging, more and more lithium peroxide is formed in the pores of this electrode. And when all the pores are filled up, no more lithium peroxide can be formed, and the battery is empty. However, the problem is right here. If we zoom in this part, the blue part, lithium peroxide, is a very bad electron conductor. Electron cannot even go through this material very well, which will dampen the whole reaction, and eventually kills off the reaction, and kills off the battery's power. Some people refer this as sudden death, the battery is not working suddenly. How dangerous it is for a car. 
electron transport is the main limiting factor of the battery performance of this lithium air battery. Firstly, we have to understand the electron transport mechanism in this discharge product, lithium peroxide. And then we can think of how we can improve this. And in this talk, I would like to invite you to come with me to go further into this atomic world materials. And let me introduce you how we look at these materials at an atomic scale and how we design materials with atomic scale. Well, more than one million times zooming, welcome to the atomic world of materials. If our eyes are as good as electron microscope, we will not see this material as a bulk. We will see this lithium peroxide is composed of lithium atoms and oxygen atoms. And we will be amazed how neatly they arrange themselves. The order arrangement of atoms is called crystal structure. Crystal structure is very important in material science because they determine the properties of materials. And in this lithium peroxide, the red balls represent oxygen atoms, and they are paired up. The bonded oxygen pairs play an important role in the conductivity of this material. And the green balls represent lithium atoms. We can view this lithium peroxide as bonded oxygen pairs embedded in the sea of lithium plus ions. Knowing this crystal structure is also very important to our simulation work because they serve as an input. With this input, we can get lots of output containing materials properties. So at this point, let me briefly introduce my simulation method. My simulation method is called first principles calculation. The name of this method also fascinates me a lot. It is called first principles calculation because it does not depend on any external parameters except atomic numbers. For example, in this calculation, I just need to know I have lithium atoms and oxygen atoms to start. So it is parameter free. And also, this calculation is based on quantum mechanics. Briefly speaking, we know that solids are made of electrons and nuclei. If we can model the basic interactions of electron and nuclei accurately, then we can get all the properties of solids emerging from this first principles calculation. Generally speaking, we have crystal structure as an input, and then Schrodinger equation is solved by supercomputers. And finally, we can get output that can predict materials properties quite well, including electronic structure I will talk about very soon. With this very cool first principle calculations, we can go further into the atomic world and see the electrons. What will happen if an electron is injected into this material? This is one of our simulation results. The yellowish re cloud represents electron density. And at the beginning, the electron is everywhere. But then it becomes more and more localized. And finally, it localized at only one place. This localized electron has a name. We call it a polaron. What is a polaron? Polaron is not a new concept. The theory of polaron has already been developed for about eight decades. We know that electrons move freely in metal. However, in some materials, the electron will be trapped and it will push the surrounding atoms away from their equilibrium position. The trapped electron, together with the surrounding atoms, we call it a polaron. Polarons move slower than free electrons because it has to go over lots of barriers when moving. It is like driving a car on a bumpy road. The speed of the car has to be slower. Similarly, polaron hopping will greatly affect electron mobility so it will influence electronic properties of many kinds of materials. Many research has focused on the part when the polaron has already formed and they move by polaronic hopping. While my research focuses on the initial stage of polaron formation. That is the transition process starting from free electron until the polaron is formed. And how long does it take for a polaron to form? 
It is in femtosecond scale, a very short time. Though this time is tiny, this time is still varies in different materials and under different situations as shown in my study. In order to study this fast transition process, we have to first know how to track these polarons. Unlike normal things, we cannot just see or measure polarons directly, but we have some ways to characterize polarons, and today I will refer them as footprints. Now I will introduce you three footprints of polaron formation. The first footprint is electron density. We have just seen a video. At the beginning, the electron is delocalized. It is everywhere. And after a while, it becomes localized at one place, and the polaron is formed. So electron density is the first footprint of polaron formation. If the first footprint help us to understand where polarons are in the space coordinate. The second footprint will help us to understand where polarons are in the energy coordinate. And here is one of our simulation results. But explaining that is a little bit complicated, so let me use an analogy. Electron states are like seats on the bus, and electrons are passengers. And in this bus, the front seat have lower energy, and the back seats have higher energy. When an extra electron gets on the bus, it behaves a little bit differently as human beings. First of all, it will run around at the back of the bus, and then it will gradually move to the front. And finally, it comes to the front and pick one particular seat. That indicates a polaron is formed. So this Density of state is another footprint of polaron formation. The third footprint is stretching of bond. That is the most straightforward one. Oxygen bonds are like springs vibrating around a certain equilibrium position. When the extra electron is delocalized, the bond remains unchanged, and they are about the same length. However, when the electron is, delocalized, is localized at one of the oxygen pairs, that pair elongates dramatically. So this bond stretching is the third footprint of polaron formation. With the three footprints I mentioned above, we can explore more of the initial stage of polaron formation. For example, with this bond stretching, we can try to estimate the polaron formation time. In my study, the time period for bonds Stretching from 1.6 angstrom to about 2.2 angstrom is defined as polaron formation time. We ran the simulation many times in different materials or under different situations to study this time. One of the studies is I do exactly the same simulation with the same material, but under much lower temperature. We see this time changes a lot. It took a much longer time for a polaron to form in lower, te in lower temperature which means the polaron formation time is temperature dependent. In our study, we also show that this time changes in different materials. And why do I study this time? And why is this formation time important? Because if we can understand this time better, we can know how to tune this time for different applications. For electronic devices, we want to accelerate electronic conductivity. So we need to promote free electrons because free electrons move faster. That is, it is better if there never forms a polaron or slower to form a polaron. In the contrary, if we would like to design some protective corrosion resistant coatings, we would like to decelerate electronic conductivity. So we want to stabilize polarons which means we want polarons to form as quickly as possible. Tuning this time can be achieved by designing materials at atomic scale. That is a bottom-up design I'm going to talk about. Let me give, up, give some examples of bottom-up design in lithium air batteries. In order to enhance charge transport of lithium peroxide, one modeling study replaced some lithium atoms with silicon atoms. It is called doping of materials. That is intentional adding impurities to enhance materials properties. This proposed tailored new material 
is expected to show significantly higher electron mobility. Similarly, in some experimental study, the capacity of lithium air batteries is significantly improved by simply adding chloride ions into the electrolyte. The chloride incorporated lithium peroxide film is shown to have higher conductivity, so as adding nickel ions, cobalt oxide ions, barium ions, and our simulation work can try to rationalize how these doped ions can improve charge transport, and we can also try to provide some guidelines for future experimental study. This atomic scale modification, though looks like insignificant, but we finally have the power to significantly improve performance of devices as we zoom out to the scale to our real life, such as try to find the cure for the sudden death of lithium air batteries. In today's journey to the atomic world, we have come a long way from macro scale, the component of devices, down to atomic scale. And when we design materials, we do the opposite direction. We design materials with bottom-up perspective perspective, starting from atomic scale and work our way to the macro scale. And as we are closing to the end of this talk, I would like to mention that polarons is not only formed in this lithium peroxide. It has reported in almost every metal oxide, organic semiconductors, and amorphous materials. We notice that these materials are often used in many kinds of energy devices, such as solar fuel cells, different kinds of batteries, organic solar cells. Understand the polaron formation is a necessary step to help improve electronic or optoelectronic properties of these energy devices. My research won't give you those high performance devices right away, but it focuses on studying energy materials from a fundamental perspective. I try to understand electron transport in the discharge product of lithium air battery. And more specifically, I try to understand the polaron formation in energy materials. It might be only one of the missing pieces in realizing the sustainable development. But I believe if all of the scientists and engineers and all of us working together towards the same goal, I'm sure the high efficiency more stable, cheaper new energy devices, and the sustainable development of our society will not be a dream anymore. Thank you, Shai Shai. So we have time for one or two questions at the back again. Thank you for that excellent talk. It was really fantastic. Um, just a simple question. Have you looked at contamination of water vapor? Water vapor? Um, you mean uh, from the lithium air battery or? The biggest problem with lithium air is water vapor contamination. Yeah, uh, for the study I'm studying, uh, my lithium air battery is in the aprotic electrolyte. So it's not a lithium water battery. But I think uh, there, there will be many research studying on that kind of thing. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Shrey Shrey again. Okay.